Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker. And before we talk about today's guests, a couple housekeeping items I want to get out of the way. First of all, merch store is open. Go to mormonbookreviews.com. Get yourself a hat, get yourself a hoodie, get yourself buttons, coffee mugs, iPod cases. I, we just keep on adding to the inventory. It's very exciting. Um, also, this is supposed to air on May 31st. Uh, and that happens to be the deadline for the book giveaway for the Jonathan Neville books, An Infinite Goodness in Moroni's America. So if you're interested in, in the drawing, and if today is the 31st, United States citizens only, um, put in your drawing for, you could you can indicate both books you would like, or, or if you already have one copy, then just have your name entered for one of the books. Go to Mormon bookrefuse at gmail.com and put into the subject heading book contest. Give me your full name and address and we'll get you entered and we'll then put you hopefully uh, good luck to all of you who enter. So uh, my guest here is Anthony Miller. Uh, Anthony, um, I want to welcome you to the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So Anthony recently gave a TED talk um, in Billings, uh, Montana, and uh, it's a pretty impactful Episodes. As a matter of fact, my mom watched it yesterday, and she was really uh, touched by it as well. And uh, so Anthony, uh, actually a couple months ago, told me about the TED Talk and said, I'd like to come on your program um, to discuss it. So what we're going to do is we're going to tape a series of about two or three episodes that deal with the TED Talk. And uh, we're going to just do about half or so, or about a third of the episode today. Uh, for those of you who are also Mormon Stories viewers, you might be aware that they had some copyright issues with YouTube. So we figured, well, let's not, let's just do seg segments at a time. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, Anthony, um, before we get started on this taping, I just want to ask you, uh, when you did the uh, TED Talk, what kind of responses have you been getting from people? Well, it's been overwhelmingly positive and it and it's been positive across the spectrum of belief uh, within the Restoration Movement uh, and LDS Mormonism. And it's been very positive uh, among the non-LDS community. So initially, when I was invited to give a TED Talk, and I told them different things that I could talk about, and I told them one thing that I could talk about is I went through an existential faith and identity crisis. And... I, uh, I processed that experience and I created a support, local support group to support others who are going through that. They said, that's what we want you to talk about. And initially I thought I would uh, put together a TED talk that, that was maybe more clinical or, or like lecture in nature in terms of that I would explain this is the experience of going through grief and and having an enmeshment of identity, you know, with your belief system and, and having that crumble on you. And in the end, I ended up completely rewriting my talk to tell my story, to walk people through the journey of loving your faith tradition, of having it completely enmeshed in your totalistic sense of identity and belonging and meaning in life, um, and then having that all crumble on you. And um, what you'll notice, uh, the viewers, when, when you watch the TED Talk, and we're only going to watch a portion of it today, uh, and then we'll pick up uh, the rest in a, in a future episode, what you notice is that I only use the word Mormon in the very first sentence of the TED Talk, um, but I walk people through that experience of existential crisis, grief, losing a sense of community and identity, and the feedback that I got in Billings, Montana, that is a fairly low percentage LDS, maybe less than 5% LDS. Uh, the majority of the people in the audience during my TED Talk have never been LDS, but it really connected with them. I had people come up after my TED Talk and hold me tight with tears in their uh, eyes and express that they had experienced different kinds of existential crisis, identity crisis, including faith crisis, uh, evangelicals, Catholics, um, all sorts of things. And so I was really touched because um, I was concerned that I was too emotional and walking people through my journey. But what I found is, is that a lot of people experience uh, severe grief, existential crisis, loss of community, things like that. And, and it was touching that uh, my story connected with them. You know, uh, as you were telling um, 
the reactions you've been getting, I am reminded of a note I just received yesterday. And I want to read part of it. And this is, uh, and I think it's important because when I went on Mormon Stories, it deeply impacted people. And I heard from people from all faith traditions, including atheists. But people told me they were crying, they were hitting pause and contemplating the things that I was saying. Um, I just want to read you this. Uh, Hello, Stephen. I wanted to share how inspiring your Mormon Stories interview was for me. I grew up in an Assemblies of God church with deep generational roots. Now, that's Pentecostal church. It's actually the largest Pentecostal church in America. I'm right. going to skip over some of the details, but this, uh, she writes, after years of depression and a suicide attempt, I've realized that th those teachings are toxic. I'm definitely in a faith crisis and found your story so inspiring. Your open acceptance and authentic love for all is something I've never encountered. Thanks for a fresh perspective for my journey. And uh, man, that hits home when you get notes from people like that. And so I feel like you're probably getting similar responses. Yeah, absolutely. Getting similar responses, including yeah. from believing LDS members that appreciated uh, how I told my journey. So yeah, it was a very, very authentically told. So before we uh, preview, uh, start um, showing um, the tape or uh, the TED talk, was there anything that you wanted to maybe uh, talk about before to set things up? Yeah, I mean, I'd preface this by saying that I'm six years into my faith transition journey. My shelves crashed on April 29th of 2016. And, um, and I don't think that I could have given this talk a year into my journey or two, or even maybe three years into my journey is when I could begin to give this talk. Um, and so I, I would express that I want people to hold grace for themselves or grace for others who are experiencing this kind of experience of a faith transition and a faith crisis, identity crisis, that aren't uh, far along in their journey where they process the grief and where they put in the work and they've received the support and so forth. So hold grace for yourself if you're early in your journey and, and, and uh, I just hold grace for yourself. Um, the next thing that I would share is in writing my talk and in giving it, I relived some of the trauma of my faith crisis. And I think you'll witness some of that in my TED talk on, on stage, um, it was very cathartic to put in the work to write it. Um, and this has reinforced the importance, not only of community, but of the process of writing and journaling and putting in the work to work through experiences of trauma and grief. And that was my experience. And, and some of what you'll witness is me reliving some of my trauma in front of an audience on stage. So in any event, those are the things that I'd like to share. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll watch part of it today. And I'd encourage you uh, to go ahead and follow the link that, that you're, that you're going to put in the show notes. So you can go and watch the balance of my TED Talk on the TEDx YouTube channel and uh, maybe include comments or questions to this episode of what you would like us to talk about when we watch the balance of my TEDx talk and, and continue the discussion. So that's what I wanted to share today. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Well, why don't you get the screen up and running and we're gonna watch a, a segment from this uh, from your TED talk uh, in Billings, Montana, and we're ready to go. All right, here we go. My parents joined the Mormon church when I was three years old in Phoenix, Arizona. We were poor. My father had a difficult time providing for us. We were used to being evicted. But our church community took care of us. You know how sometimes church congregations adopt a family for Christmas because otherwise that family might not have a Christmas? That was our family. My parents divorced when I was a teenager. My father struggled to provide support. So as the oldest of four children, I mowed lawns and delivered pizza while my mother did sewing and alterations out of the little old modified farm shack of a house we rented. And we felt grateful for months. We only had to rely on our church for help with just food. My church gave me friends, community, and role models. It gave me hope of what a stable family could look like. As a 19-year-old, I served two years as a full-time missionary in Barcelona, Spain. As I dedicated 60 to 70 hours each week striving to bring people unto Christ through baptism and confirmation, 
I had many spiritual experiences. As I taught, contemplated scriptures, prayed, and performed ordinances like baptisms, I sensed a deep connection in my heart. Love, peace, joy, the fruits of the Spirit, a swelling warmth in my being. I attributed meanings to these experiences as if they were metaphorical vines that intertwined around my heart. The primary meaning was that these experiences were from God, giving me reliable divine witnesses of the truthfulness of the things I was teaching and reading and that I was doing God's work. Approaching the end of my mission, I found myself in a deep internal struggle. I needed to know for sure whether the offering of my mission was acceptable to God. So I fasted and I prayed for several days, pleading in prayer for an answer. One evening, I found myself sitting on a couch in a small, humble apartment living room of a family we had recently taught and baptized where I felt like I received my sacred answer from God. The mother of the family asked me to read her journal entry of the day of her baptism, and as I read it, I felt a softening in my chest, a warmth in my heart. Tears streamed down my face as almost audible words came to me that for me, the purpose of this life is to live with gratitude for the opportunity to participate in the lives of others, and that whether or not my mission was an acceptable offering was the wrong question because that was about me instead of about God and others. Our ministering presence to this humble family in their time of spiritual need, once strangers but now holding hands as brothers and sisters in Christ, amplified that gratitude in my being. With this experience, I intertwined and interlayered additional vines and layers of meaning around my heart, that my church was true, that I was the child of a God who loved me and I knew my place in the universe. For the following three decades of my life, I had many experiences like these. For example, as a Sunday school teacher, in preparing my lessons, I prayed to God that I might be an instrument in his hands to touch the lives of my class members. On Sundays, with a prayer in my heart, I greeted those class members as they entered the room, and I often felt led by God in the things that I taught. Many times, members approached me after class to express that they really needed specific things that were part of that day's discussion, sometimes even as answers to their prayers. I experienced a constant positive feedback loop of these kinds of experiences and also serendipitous experiences that happened during my life for which I continually intertwined and interlayered additional vines and layers of meaning. Nonetheless, the primary meaning I attributed was that these spiritual experiences represented reliable divine witnesses of the truthfulness of my church and its teachings. Now, I should say that over the years, I encountered many things that challenged my testimony and triggered dissonance for me, things like conflicts in scriptures that I couldn't reconcile or problematic teachings from church leaders that violated my conscience, things that I couldn't reconcile with what I understood about science and history. I applied critical thinking to other areas of my life, but with regard to my faith, I set those irreconcilable problems aside as if books on a metaphorical shelf, in faith that God would provide me further light and knowledge about them someday. But over time, my shelf grew massive. It was heavy laden and sagging. Nonetheless, the cumulative intertwined vines and layers around my heart had grown into my heart, offering me such a sense of certainty that it prevented me from allowing my metaphorical shelf to collapse. My beliefs, my community, my roles, my reputation, my family connections, how I made sense of life were completely enmeshed in my personal sense of identity and these intertwined vines and layers of meaning around my heart that eventually became one with my heart. Then six years ago, our 22-year-old son came out to us as gay. In my church, the only valid paths for him would be to live a completely celibate life, painfully absent comprehensive love, or to live in a mixed orientation marriage, also without full capacity for comprehensive love for him or for his wife. Deep in my heart, the God I knew wouldn't want my son to live a life painfully absent 
the kinds of comprehensive love that my wife and I share. I couldn't metaphorically shelf that depth of cruelty as coming from the God I knew. So that evening I anxiously searched online for resources as to how a believer could support a gay son. In my search on my church's website, I accidentally stumbled across what are called the church history gospel topics essays that discuss topics I had always led to believe were anti-church lies. As it turns out, they weren't lies. They were just history. I consumed the balance of my church's 13 essays that evening, and with that information, I recognized that many of my treasured spiritual experiences had confirmed the truthfulness of many partially or entirely false things, as I understood them. It also seemed to me that during my church's history, its leaders routinely lacked the capacity to discern between their own biases and prejudices and actual inspiration from God. The deepest meanings that I attributed to my spiritual experiences as reliable divine witnesses of truth hadn't only proven false for me, but they also seemed to prove false for the leaders of my church too. I also learned that night that the leaders of my church knew this information and to protect faith, they excluded it from lesson manuals and they often took retributive actions against scholars who published about it. It violated my core values. It, it, I sensed a deep betrayal in my heart, but the most painful was I recognized that my spiritual experiences weren't what I thought they were. This combined recognition shattered my heavy shelf. All the irreconcilable problems and dissonance that I accumulated over the decades lie in a pile of scattered broken pieces on the floor. Also in those very moments, all the intertwined vines and layers of meaning around my heart that became one with my heart were abruptly and violently ripped from me leaving my heart a shredded, bloody, tangled mess. My very identity in those moments became an empty void. The heavens closed, and it was as if the God I always knew never existed in the first place, notwithstanding my cries out to him in those very moments. I later learned that what I experienced that night is often referred to as the dark night of the soul. But for me, it was more than one night. So you're on mute real quick. Um, yeah, that was very powerful. All uh, right, that's what we'll do today. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing that. So that's about half of your TED Talk. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, you know, so interesting because it, yeah, yeah, you had your shelf breaking. And, you know, I just, it reminds me of, I was flying back from, Utah my last trip and I was heading to Denver as a stopover and I'm sitting next to a guy who's a co-pilot who's heading to his job for the airline that I was flying on and uh, we started talking he's from Idaho and he said yeah about a year and a half ago I read Saints and he said I read that book and I I'm not he said I'm out of here and just even reading the church history book you know true church approved history book uh, was enough to break his shelf and of course those gospel topics essays um, really affected you. I just, I just want to get, what was it like? So I, I want, what, what, when you're, because so often people will tell you, I knew the, the moment I became an atheist is when this happened or quit believing. Whereabouts in the gospel to topics essays, do you remember a moment where you're reading something? Yeah, for me, the very moment, I, I read a few of them, but I read, it was when I was reading the race and the priesthood essay. And I was born in 1966, so I was 12 years old in 1978, and I had an elementary school friend uh, named JJ, and he was African American, and that was maybe one of the first times that I really shelved something because of the teachings about my friend, like maybe he was a less valiant spirit or something like that. I, I, I couldn't hold that, and, and I remember what was taught as doctrine. Um, I remember what was in McConkie's book. I remember what I was taught in church and by my leaders and so forth. And, and these are men that like, they bore testimony. They had spiritual experiences that they interpreted as reliable divine witnesses of the doctrines 
that they believed were doctrines that they were teaching about the race ban prior to the ban happening, as well as when the ban was lifted after it happening. So in any event, with that context, um, I shelved that because I'd had a hard time with it. I didn't know what to make of it. I accepted some of the apologetic responses, but they really didn't settle my soul. And so that was on my shelf. And when I was reading the race and the priesthood essay, there's a paragraph with, uh, with footnote number nine. And, and the paragraph says that Brigham Young uh, foretold that there would be a day when Blacks would receive all the blessings of the priesthood and more. And like, I had never remember hearing that or teaching that when I taught Sunday school or when I was high priest group leader you know, in the lesson manual where we covered Brigham Young, I had never remembered that. And so I followed the links to the footnotes and the footnotes have two uh, speeches from Brigham Young. Uh, and, and the second one is he gave the very day after, which I didn't know this had happened, but the very day after he and the Utah legislature had established Utah's as a legal slave territory in uh in the u.s the only legal slave territory of the ter non-states and i read that speech from brigham young and he in that speech he's alluding to adam god and he's talking about blood atonement and he's talking about a penalty of death by decapitation for like a newborn mixed race child or for a couple that have a mis mixed race offspring and, and all sorts of other horrific things that the church would totally disavow now. And in, in the talk, he suggests that at the end of the restitution of all things, after all the sons of Abel uh, had first received the opportunity of the priesthood, then blacks would receive the blessings of the priesthood and more. And it seemed to me what he was saying in that talk was, that wide noses and things that he thought were unattractive about the black race were a mark of the, this curse. And that at the end of the millennium, after all white people, it seems what that he was saying at the end of the millennium, after all the resurrections, all the white people had first received the priesthood, then blacks would receive the blessings of the priesthood and the curse would be taken from them and they would be made white and that their African-American features or their African features would be changed to be Caucasian. And it seemed like that what is what he was saying, and that what he was saying didn't have anything to do with what happened in 1978. And so when I was reading that talk, what the recognition for me, what it, how I interpreted it was, there is no discernment. People who taught these things that had spiritual experiences that they interpreted it as reliable divine witnesses of truth, they weren't reliable divine witnesses of truth. Um, I recognized that I had spiritual experiences that I thought had confirmed the truthfulness of things that weren't accurate, either partially or entirely. And also in those moments, if I, I concluded, this was how I interpreted it, that the essay was dishonest, uh, that it was trying to mislead the person. That's what I perceive. The person reading the essay that maybe didn't read the footnote would say, oh, Brigham Young totally prophesied what would happen in 1978. He'd be totally cool with this, right? And then as I read the balance of the essay, it called things that were, I, were taught to me as doctrine, it called them theories. And it talked about how there never was a church-wide policy of segregation. But when I didn't know what to do with this, I searched and found reviews of the essay on Mormon Think, and I discovered on Mormon Think that there were localized segregation that was approved by the brethren, and that felt dishonest to me too. So the combination of all these things that it perceived, I perceived that there actually wasn't discernment, spiritual experiences hadn't been reliable divine witnesses of truth for the brethren for over 125 years. My spiritual experiences had confirmed the truthfulness of partially or entirely inaccurate things. And the essay approved by the brethren felt misleading intentionally or dishonest to me. In that moment, that's what crashed my shelf. And in doing that, 
my sensation was the heavens closed and God ceased to exist. And in spite of praying, pleading to him in those moments, because it was so traumatic, because the meaning that I attributed to my deepest, most treasured spiritual experiences all crumbled on me. And because that was so enmeshed in my sense of identity, my perception of God crumbled on me. So Gina Colvin refers to this as God leaving the corner of the room where you once knew him. And that's a more eloquent way of saying what happened to me, but that's what it was like. And that was the moment I still studied the balance of the essays and I found other problematic things, but it was while I was reading the race and the priesthood essay, in particular, those cited speeches of Brigham Young. Fascinating. Fascinating. You know, it reminds me, um, when I interviewed Don Bradley, we talked about how he lost his faith. And of course, I lost my faith for a while, quite a while. And I said, people don't understand is that when you, atheists often are grieving because they lost their best friend. Yeah. I mean, it's like more, I, it's the, uh, I think it was Mark McCarg, one of the liturgist podcast contributors in his book, Finding God in the Waves he explains his dark night of the soul moment when God leaves the corner of the room uh, where he once knew him. He describes it as worse than having his father died because it was not only his father in heaven, it was his best friend for all of his life. And when that crumbled on him, it was, it was beyond the most painful grieving experience and loss of anything and my experience was similar to that. It was the most painful. It, it, it was, I mean, it was really an existential identity and faith crisis all wrapped up into one. I want to explore that theme in our coming episodes as well. I wanted to ask you, you had said that you, your parents were converts to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Yeah, all my ancestors are Mennonite. Uh, I was born in Goshen, Indiana. My mother's father was Nelson Kaufman. He was a very, he'd be the equivalent of a general authority in the Mennonite church. Uh, and um, my mother's mother wrote historical fiction. And in the LDS church, Gerald Lund wrote the Work in the Glory series of uh, kind of historical fiction. My uh, grandmother, Christmas Carol Kaufman, wrote historical fiction about the Anabaptist movement. Um, and then on my father's side, my grandparents were very involved uh, in the Mennonite church in Goshen, Indiana, in that area as well. So all my ancestors were Mennonite, and my parents had questions that they didn't feel like they received satisfying answers to over the years. So when I was three years old, they moved to the Phoenix area of Arizona for health reasons to get in a dry climate, and they stumbled across the missionaries and the missionaries had some of the answers for them, uh, like elders anointing the sick with oil, or what happens to people that have never received an opportunity to hear about Jesus, uh, things like that. And uh, they joined the church when I was three years old in Phoenix, Arizona. And just, uh, I'm curious, did, did you recognize as a child that your family was poor? Because we you talk about that in, in there. I mean, what, what yeah. did you realize at a young age that you were poor, or what was that? What was that realization like? Yeah, we. My father. My father has uh, some ADD and manic depressive tendencies that made it very difficult for him to keep a job or stay with a business opportunity, and so we were constantly evicted. I think I counted, I went to eight different elementary schools because we were constantly moving and I was the shortest little redheaded kid in the class. It was tough, you know, going to a new school because then the bully has to test to see how strong you are and so forth. Um, all of our clothes were pretty much always hand-me-downs and more often than not, when my parents were married, we still relied on the church for help from the church welfare system. Um, with the Bishop's storehouse and so forth. And then after my parents were divorced, when I was around 14, um, uh, my father struggled to provide child support. So my mother did sewing and alterations out of her home and I mowed lawns uh, for, of houses and apartment buildings. And then when I was able to drive, I delivered pizza too. Um, 
and yeah, I, I knew, I knew we were poor. I was pretty defensive about it. Um, it was kind of embarrassing, um, being the poorest people in the ward, but the, our wards were always fantastic. They were compassionate to us. We had Christmases because of them. You know, we lived in this little modified farm shack of a house that I think maybe cost $150 a month to rent, had a wooden foundation. I didn't have a bedroom. I slept on the couch. Um, and the ward came over, our, they were our, we were the service project for the ward. So they came over and helped trim the tree branches away from the house. So in a windstorm, the tree branches wouldn't come down and damage the house. So um, uh, I, it affected me in that I experienced significant gratitude for the participation of others in my, my life and the support that they gave us. But I did also feel strongly that I needed to be able to prove myself, like, you know, that I was going to be a good provider for my family and things like that. But I was very aware of how poor we were, definitely. Well, off camera, when, before we started taping, um, you know, one of the questions I had was, um, you know, your son came out and you had to deal with that. How is your son doing today? He is doing fast, fantastic. He and his partner, Jaden, have been together more than six years. And they're both software engineers for Microsoft, doing fantastic work. They're doing great. Um, uh, they've been very well accepted by our family across the spectrum of belief. So even our staunchest, most uh, orthodox believing Mormon family totally love and accept our son and his partner, Jaden. And uh, they're, they're just doing great. Um, uh, I would say that my wife and I, uh, we responded the way that we needed to and that it was, it was, you might as well have told us that your eyes were blue instead of brown. You know, that doesn't make any difference. We, we love you. And the first time we met Jaden, it, it was just really sweet. My son leaned over to my wife and and she, he said to her, isn't he amazing? And uh, it was amazing to see our son in love and happy. It was just really amazing. That's great. Yeah, I'm glad. Son's doing good. He's thriving, folks. That's he awesome. Is. Yes. Um, Anthony, I want to thank you so much for coming onto the program today. I'm really looking forward to our next two segments. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Any final words you'd like to share with the audience? Come back and, and watch part two. Watch part two. Leave comments uh, about maybe, uh, so maybe you can help guide our conversation for parts two and three. I want to thank everybody for uh, watching today. Just to remind my audience to, don't forget to hit, uh, to like and subscribe and hit the notification button for when a new episode comes out. We're on all the major podcast formats. We're in the process of getting those out uh, uh, getting a lot of people listening to us on the podcast. So I want to thank you all. Also, for those of you who'd like to support the channel, uh, we, you can support us as a Patreon, as well as uh, through, uh, if you want to make a direct contribution through PayPal, you can do that as well. Those links will all be in the description. We also provide a link for the TED Talk. So be prepared, watch the whole thing and get ready to do another recap and conversation about uh, in part two of our series. Uh, once again, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. And you all have yourself a wonderful day.